So by way of introduction, can I welcome you to the presentation around research and what it tells us about online distance technology supported learning. Um, and I think it's important in our current context to have a good understanding of what might be of value, what we want, might want to reflect on uh, around how we use research to inform our judgments, to inform our decisions and to inform our, our practice. Um, what I want to do is to focus on, on a fairly detailed presentation, uh, but I think the links and the information on them you might find useful in the longer term if there are areas where you want to consider, reflect, uh, or know more. Um, so what I want to do is break it up into kind of five general areas. One is the big picture. What does research tell us about whether blended, supported, is any good? Does it work for us? For managers, what do the research findings tell us that could be helpful, that could help us make good judgments, that could help our planning? The big issues, what are the big issues for managers and practitioners to consider um, if they want to plan a good blended or distance learning experience? Um, and what are the lessons? Can I summarize the key lessons from research that we want to point to? Uh, and I want a few slides at the end just to remind you where there are other sources of useful information. And I suppose if we start with the big, big picture discussion, is blended any good? Um, well, it's well established. The Open University has been around for decades. It's, it's highly successful. It's well researched. But the problem that we have with the research is traditionally research is done on willing participants. There are very few um, circumstances where people are conscripted into blended or distance learning uh, after signing up for something else. And ethically, nobody would support that kind of research. So there's a question around the validity and reliability generally of research applying to our full situation at the moment. By that, I mean the lockdown situations where it was a complete transfer. Um, the college experience broadly uh, over the lockdown period and at the end of the year tells an interesting story. Broadly similar outcomes, um, but internally, some variations around subjects. And I would say variation by SCQF level is only part of the story. Um, there's some variation by learner group, but SCQF level is the most obvious with those on the lower levels having the most challenge to engage in blended or distance learning. I want to start with quite a big and quite a classic research study uh, that, that tells a bit of a story. Um, and the story it tells is blended learning broadly um, is good. A lot of these studies are, are meta studies. So they look at a range of other research activities. Uh, and there was a fairly large one. Eric is a, an American educational resource that's been around for years that pulls research together. Um, they looked at a thousand studies and they found that on average, students in online learning conditions performed better than those receiving face-to-face -face instructions. Uh, now, if you actually look at the detail, there's a question about whether it's blended or online or distance. Uh, the, the studies were not all identical, but I think one of the big messages that that tells us, and it is echoed in a number of places, is that blended distance online learning has the potential to be at least as effective as delivery that's on campus. Um, there, there was a study in Columbia, it's not that old, um, where they looked at the grades of community college, the, the nearest American balance uh, to what we do in our colleges, um, to compare how the same students did when they took online versus face-to-face. -face. Um, and there was a lot of detail that came out of that study that was quite interesting. Um, they found that students performed worse on, sorry, they found that all students performed worse in online classes generally, but they found that particular groups of students seemed to struggle more. So for them, it was different client groups that they were interested in. So they talked about African-American at lower point grave average. If you look at the study itself, it also generally seems to imply that younger learners were less successful um, and people with less academic opportunity and skill and by that, I mean broadly, those that hadn't studied before, those you know that had limited experience, 
perhaps high school only experience. So those that had some study under their belt and some experience of independent study and independent learning uh, did okay, but those without struggled. And they found differences in subject delivery, uh, although the differences are not the ones that we're finding quite as clearly here um, in the college experience. Uh, but they talked about English and social science as two examples. Um, here, those are highly theoretical uh, subjects. So it's not the indication that I'm getting. Social science in particular, for the colleges I've spoken to, uh, social scientists seem to be um, flourishing in the, the online environment. But it does highlight differences in groups of students in terms of their performance. And that's something that I don't think we've fully taken account of. Open University did another study um, and some of the things to come out, and please forgive me, these studies are all 40, 50 page extensive um, documents, but what I'm trying to pull out are key messages that they draw to our attention. Uh, one of the things from this study that, that struck me was um, the limited type of teaching and learning activity um, so they didn't use experience or interactive or research or communications uh, or producing uh, artifacts, products, um, as well as they should have. Um, they, they found educators generally weren't strong in their learning design and the educators generally used broadcast models of online interaction. And the broadcast models had limited the impact or less impact is probably a fairer description. Again, on the big picture, uh, there was another study um, that actually looked at the differences in exam performance. Originally, that was what it was set up to do. Uh, but one of the things that came out of that, it was around STEM education. Um, and they were quite clear that uh, exam performance could be, might be, and was in their study similar, but students were less satisfied with their courses. And I think if you look at the research as a whole, one of the things that's quite significant is the challenge of retention and engagement. And student satisfaction correlates with retention and engagement. If you don't have high levels of satisfaction, you're not going to keep the learners uh, and they're less likely, therefore, to succeed. So one of the things that we need to reflect on in the big picture is to make sure that our blended or online experiences are strong enough uh, to keep the levels of satisfaction up. And I'll, I'll point to a few studies that, that tell us how we might do that or how we might learn lessons uh, around that. So summarizing the big picture messages, blended, online, digitally mediated. Um, broadly, research is telling us it can be and should be as effective, um, but we would expect differences at SCQF level. There's a, a few studies that talk much more about the learning experience and the skills that learners have. So it's not necessarily just about the level of SEQF level, it's about whether this is the first year of learning. So people will prosper better if it's the second year or third year uh, of learning beyond school. But part of the message in there is, if they have the learning skills, they'll do better. So there's a message for us about our induction and support processes to make sure people have the skills to timetable, to research, to analyze, to self-study. Uh, those skills are part of making the process successful, not just the engagement once it starts. Second big picture item is some learners don't do as well as others. And at the moment, I don't think there's enough research to tell us who those people are. Broadly, that less experience is part of it, but we may want to re reflect on our own experience to see what subject areas or what activities um, help people um, prepare better and do well. And if there are particular learners that need additional support, we need to identify that early and clearly. And another big picture, I suppose, summary message is, and it won't surprise anyone in this call, teaching overall tends to derive rely much more on exposition and lecture type engagements. And we know that the interactive activity is what keeps online people engaged, is what makes them successful. A few things around management, and th this came from the ERIC study. Um, online learning has a stigma. Uh, they found out that it carries a stigma of being lower quality. And you probably all know of other studies that tell you that placebos uh, are effective even if you know they're placebos. 
And I think to some extent, this works the other way around. If it has a stigma of being lower quality, people expect lower quality and respond in a poorer way. So although that wasn't absolutely evident in the study, I suspect that's a strong effect that we have to reflect on and we have to deal with. There's a, a raft of studies uh, that are quite useful around the fact that online delivery can give meta skills, it can give more appropriate learning skills as part of the whole experience. And those meta skills that we develop are the things that will help people long term in life. So there's a strong argument to say that online learning ought to be your medium, ought to be our approach of choice, uh, because the, the range of skills that people develop if they're successful will suit them well in the long term. And that, that relates to the fact that they learn to work collaboratively, think creatively, study independently. Those are the skills that you want to develop uh, in young people, in learners. Um, so the online and the blended environment is ideal to do that if it's well designed. Sorry, it says management level research introduction, but what I mean is about the introduction of technology, not an introduction to the subject. And there were four clear recommendations that come. There's quite a few good things coming from the Education Endowment Foundation, but four big lessons from their work is about considering how technology will improve teaching and learning before introducing it. Um, not an option that we had in lockdown, but it should be one that we reflect on as managers in the long term. It can improve the quality of the explanations and modeling, so we should be considering how to use technology creatively to deal with subjects like physics or whatever, so that we can uh, create artifacts and interactions that, that can get information over in a different and more convincing and motivating way. It can improve the impact of pupil practice and it can play a role in improving assessment and feedback. Assessment in an online environment should be a much more regular and structured thing uh, because you can't informally pick things up as you can in a classroom. Uh, but the quality of assessment, the way we track assessment, the analytics we get from assessment should all allow us to improve our teaching and improve their learning as a result of using technology. Ofsted did a study in July around the colleges in England, and there's a few things that came from that that might be of interest. Um, learners missed classroom environment, some apprentices, and it was a limited sample, so I think this applies to quite a lot of students, not just apprentices, but that's my assumption rather than what it states. They enjoyed the extra time with staff having no travel. Um, it is relatively efficient if you don't have to travel, you don't have to have lunch away from home. Uh, you know, there are things that, that, that create efficiency and those that were quite enthusiastic learners found that a real benefit. Lower SEQF levels, less successful as we'd anticipated, and the varying competence and confidence of staff um, had a strong impact uh, on success. Further, they found that, that there was a lot of ingenuity. Staff found creative ways of um, teaching learners, I suppose, if I could describe it that way. But the issue they found in July was the challenge of evaluating and assessing practical skills. Um, they found like a lot of the other studies that materials that staff used were often not as interactive as you would hope and that teachers didn't always use them well to help learners. And I think there's a message for us that that's probably the case here. And many providers have reinforced briefings about learners keeping safe online. There's a big issue generally about or big concern around online safety. Um, I think for most colleges, that's less of an issue here because blended to an extent has been embedded for some time, uh, but it certainly was a, a big issue uh, when people were thrown into lockdown in England. A few of the other big issues that we might want to reflect on, social presence. There's a lot of studies that basically say social presence is the thing that keeps student satisfaction and student retention. So you have to design your experience so that there is a clear and strong social presence. There's also related research that says that social presence means that the relationship with the person teaching, the, the tutor, is more important in an online environment than the relationship with peers, because that relationship with peers doesn't develop to the same extent online or doesn't develop in the same way online. 
Um, so that social presence, they have to feel engaged with the tutor. It has to be part of the, the thing that gives them satisfaction is the social element of the engagement. A well-designed experience. Um, if my memory serves me right, uh, Joe Wilson, City of Glasgow, you're using ABC learning design. But what all the research tells us is using a pedag pedagogically informed model. So you, if you have a learning design model, uh, you are likely to have a better and more successful experience for the learner. So you've got to think through the, the things that plan and deliver a good experience. It's not simply thinking through the subject material, which is often what goes through the head of a, le a lecturer in a classroom because of the rest of the stuff happens naturally as they present and engage. Um, so it, it's a big predictor of success is to have a well-designed experience. I'm going to pull together a few of those uh, to say it's got some stigma. We need to deal with that if, if we want to make sure that people are, are confident and satisfied. The fact that they will develop other skills, we should be planning those other skills as part of the story and not simply hoping that they pick up those skills. Planning is everything and the importance of engagement with uh, the teacher and others, the social presence. So giving them tasks as smaller groups works better because they can engage, whereas given class size tasks are going to be less successful. Effective professional learning is fairly obvious, uh, so I won't dwell on that. Um, but we have to upskill our staff so that they, they have the learning design capability to do this better. And teacher, sorry, teaching quality is more important than how learners, are, sorry, how lessons are delivered. Um, effective teaching, just as you would have in the classroom with good explanations, appropriate feedback, uh, scaffolding, building on existing knowledge, that type of teaching quality pervades good online experiences. Learner analytics are a good part of the story. You can draw in data and make judgments about how well people are doing, how much they're engaging. And there's a lot of research that basically says the more communication and the more engagement, uh, the more likely they are to be successful. So your material should be designed to do that and your analytics should be designed to monitor that. Some learners will prosper more than others and always include that range of learning activities uh, to, to make things work well. In terms of further support, there's a raft of things around. There's stuff from Google. Um, Jisk uh, and Jason, if my memory serves me right, you've got 78 guides on your, uh, your site around uh, Jisk. And Jisk provide really good guides on things like assessment, uh, inclusion, that, that kind of area of work. And that's based on well-established experience and research. Um, CDN Virtual Bridge Sessions that you obviously all know about um, and CDN's own resource bank around online delivery, as well as the OU guide. Um, in terms of input, I tried to be brief and summarise the high level messages, uh, but I'm happy now that we move forward to any questions or discussion colleagues. Uh, but for those uh, who are watching the recording, thank you for taking the time uh, to watch this YouTube video and keep watching uh, the CDN and JISC supported virtual bridge sessions. Thank you.